Hello, this is the Eastern Europe Review, joint project of Belsat and TVP World with reports and analysis from Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. I'm Alexandra Shapalina and these are the main stories. The world is waiting for the Ukrainian counteroffensive, but the question remains if it is possible to take control over the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant without the use of military force. My sources say that the number of soldiers in Energodar has increased. The amount of military equipment around Energodar is also growing. Russians have celebrated the 78th anniversary of Victory Day while their country is involved in military aggression against Ukraine. May the 9th is not my holiday, the holiday of my grandfathers and great-grandfathers. My holiday will be when we conquer Ukraine. Belarusian highways are falling into disrepair and Alexandra Lukashenko shifts the blame onto local officials. How have the roads in Belarus ended up in such a horrific condition? A lot of key points are still unresolved, and the infrastructure will deteriorate because the repair is slower than wear and tear. The Ukrainian military understands that during the counteroffensive they will have to bypass the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. According to Petr Kotin, the head of the Energoatom state enterprise, Ukraine can regain control of the NPP without the use of force, simply by cutting off supply lines to the facility. Earlier, representatives of the International Atomic Energy Agency reported that the occupation authorities of Energodar, where the power plant is located, have begun evacuating residents, most of whom are personnel of the now-occupied nuclear power plant. What could the consequences be? We will explain in the next story. Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is located in the occupied city of Energodar in southern Ukraine. This is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe and the most powerful in Ukraine, with six nuclear reactors. It used to generate 20% of Ukraine's electricity, that is a fifth of the country's needs, but it has been stopped since last September. The occupying administration has had problems with a shortage of personnel, since some of the personnel, from those who remained in occupied Anegodar, refused to cooperate with the Russian administration. It was announced that the number of employees at the station is 4,000 in total, whereas there are about 3,000 of them now. These people are not enough for routine work to maintain security systems, even in the situation when the units have not produced electricity since September. One shift needs 247 people from all workshops, and there should be three or four shifts a day, according to my sources from the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant itself. Between 111 and 117 people are currently working on a shift. That is half as much, and this carries the risk that the plant's systems will degrade, and not only the security systems, but also the pipelines, and even the storage of spent fuel and so on. On May the 10th, the Ukrainian state-owned enterprise Energoatom announced Russia's plans to take the power plant employees out of Energodar under the pretext of evacuation. Later, this information was confirmed by representatives of the International Atomic Energy Agency. They claim that their experts cannot evaluate the extent of the evacuation because they do not have access to the city of Energodar. In other words, this means that IAEA experts are being held hostage at the station. That means that they live, sleep and eat inside the territory, enclosed by a fence along the perimeter of which there are Russian military. My sources say that the number of soldiers in Energodar has increased. The amount of military equipment around Energodar is also growing. All sorts of rocket launchers have been spotted. Petro Kotin, the head of the Ukrainian Energoatom state enterprise, assured that it is possible to take control of the nuclear power plant without using military force. The only thing needed is to cut supply lines so that the Russians will be blocked inside the station. The only question is how soon Ukraine will be able to bring the state back under its control. It is mined along the perimeter. It is mined along the territory of the station. They mined everything they could. 
And in fact, the first thing is that the military will go there and take care of their security measures. Nevertheless, in anticipation of a counteroffensive by the armed forces of Ukraine, the occupying authorities are taking documentation and computer equipment out of the city, according to Ukrainian authorities. IAEA Director Rafael Grossi said earlier that the situation in the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant area is becoming more and more unpredictable and potentially unsafe, and he expressed concern about the very real nuclear safety risks that nuclear power plants face. This week, Russia celebrated the 78th anniversary of victory in the Second World War. This is the second parade in Moscow and Red Square since the start of the full-scale war in Ukraine. Many regions of the country brought in restrictions this year. The authorities cancelled festive events. The main motive behind this year, Victory Day celebration, is to draw parallels between the soldiers of the Second World War and those involved in the Russian armed aggression against Ukraine. At the same time, dozens of military marches were held in which children were actively involved. May the 9th, 2023, 10 a.m. Moscow time. The event that in Russia is called the Victory Parade begins on Red Square. There was no such tradition in the Soviet Union. The whole time the communists were in power, since 1945, such parades were organized only four times. Vladimir Putin's administration, after he came to power in the year 2000, not only made this event an annual one, but also actively used the victory in the Second World War in its domestic propaganda. The cult of this war and victory in it was created. Traditionally, such parades on a smaller scale are also held in Russian regions. But this year, due to the war with Ukraine, authorities cancelled most of the events. It's exciting! My heart is just stirring when I see people celebrating, children dancing. A holiday with tears in my eyes. Authorities decided to congratulate the few surviving veterans of that war locally. They gave to veterans paper letters of thanks and a box of chocolates. In the village of Zvonarevka in the Saratov region, the military marched in formation past the home of a 99-year-old military adjuster, Maria Limanskaya, and gave a concert for her. <laughs> The slogan, never again, which had been the leitmotif of this day, disappeared from the official speeches of the authorities. It was finally replaced by the slogan, we can do it again. The war of the USSR and its allies against the Nazis is being equated with Russia's aggression in Ukraine. These parades are a contradiction of words and deeds between the shiny uniforms and the fact that these soldiers are marching. Beautiful. And here they are, according to Russians, supposed to win. But that isn't happening. In the Russians' mind, their grandfathers took Berlin and they can't even take Bakhmut. And now they have dug trenches and are afraid of an attack by the armed forces of Ukraine, which they never took seriously before. This year, the authorities in Russia cancelled the immortal regiment action. However, this time the government feared that Russians would come out to the streets with photos of those who have died in the war with Ukraine. It's one of the reasons why authorities banned this initiative. However, propaganda did its job. Many regions launched the so-called immortal regiment in the form of public motor rallies. In Tumen, people who like to swim in cold water decided to swim with portraits of the frontline soldiers. In Tatarstan, children from kindergartens were brought out to march in the immortal regiment format. The kids marched on the grounds of preschools to patriotic songs. Children this year are particularly being used in the propaganda of the war. <laughs> The recording of the song was directed by an elementary school teacher from Chita and shot by her third grade classmates. In Krasnodar region, the city of Yezk, kindergarten pupils marched in Soviet and camouflage uniforms. 
May the 9th is not my holiday, the holiday of my grandfathers and great-grandfathers. My holiday will be when we conquer Ukraine. According to the latest data from the Kremlin-controlled Sociological Center for Public Opinion Research, 65% of Russians today say that Victory Day is the most important holiday. Approximately the same percentage believe that the USSR could have defeated fascism without the help of its allies. It turns out that even patching potholes and roads is difficult for political outcasts. Belarusian highways are falling into disrepair. The transport tax paid by Belarusians is clearly not enough to maintain the roads in a decent condition. As usual, Lukashenko shifts the blame onto local officials. But what actually has caused Belarusian roads to be in such a deplorable state? Two out of three Belarusians are dissatisfied with the state of roads in their area, according to data from the Institute of Sociology of the Belarusian Academy of Sciences. Two years ago, according to the same source, around 40% of people were dissatisfied. So what has happened? Belarus used the opportunity to obtain funds from European banks, such as the Bank for Reconstruction and Development and so on. This money was allocated on favorable terms and without any specific obligations. That is, it wasn't necessary to introduce a toll on roads. Since the European financial markets have been closed to us, there is no such possibility anymore. Because of the sanctions of the West, Today's regime, which falsified the 2020 presidential elections, carries out mass repressions and helps Putin in the war against Ukraine, can't receive European money for any infrastructure projects. In a so-called address to the people, in March, Alexander Lukashenko gave assurances that there would be a great future for projects started with foreign funds, saying that it is a matter of honor to finish them independently. At the same time, according to the Ministry of Transport and Communications, even the exits from the Belarusian capital city Minsk have not been repaired for more than 20 years, and the quality of roads is constantly deteriorating, while the volume of pothole repairs is increasing. This year, there are plans to repair 4.5 million square meters of roads in this way. One square meter of road patching is eight times more expensive than a meter of new road surface. The specificity of pothole repair is that funds are allocated to a certain area of work and how many potholes will be filled there and how they will be filled, this is decided by the operator. Therefore, pothole repair is very profitable for construction organizations. You can save a lot of the allocated money and have more income. More than 50% of roads in the Vitebsk region require immediate repair. Vitebsk officials have said bridges are a separate problem. We have a very big problem with bridges. Almost throughout the whole territory of Belarus, repairs have to be expected for decades. A lot of key points are still unresolved. And the infrastructure will deteriorate because the repair is slower than wear and tear. Two major road projects in Belarus in recent years were made with European money. In 2010, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development allocated $150 million for the modernization of the M5 Minsk-Gomel road. As a result, the Minsk-Babrusk route was expanded from two to four lanes, six two-level interchanges, seven overpasses, Four new bridges and two underground crosswalks were built. In 2015, the same bank allocated $250 million for the reconstruction of the M6 road minsk horadnya The mostly two-lane road became four-lane. Bumpers and noise protection screens were installed, and adjacent pipelines were replaced. Within the credit agreement with the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, there were plans to reconstruct the M3 Minsk Vitebsk Road and 13 bridges. But after the 2020 crackdown of peaceful protests, the bank stopped cooperation with the Belarusian state sector. Chinese and Russian interest in Belarus as a transport corridor remains questionable. The expenses of the Republic's road fund already exceed double its income. 
That's all for today. Thank you for watching Eastern Europe Review. We will be back next week with the new stories. I'm Alexandra Shapalina. Keep watching TVP World and see you next time.